For those of uh, you who have joined us from outside of the ARC Evidence-Based Practice Center program virtually um, at our colleague organizations such as uh, U.S. Cochrane, U.S. Grade, VA Evidence Synthesis Program, PCORI, GIN North America, others, uh, welcome. Uh, we are having this second uh, Grand Rounds uh, series session of the calendar year uh, as part of our annual in-person ARC uh, Evidence-Based Practice Center program meeting here in Rockville, Maryland. So we're just getting underway a little late, but uh, it's, it's my pleasure um, to introduce the session, our keynote speaker, and, and our panel um, this morning. Um, our first session of this uh, series, uh, this calendar year, uh, in recognizing the EPC program's 25th anniversary, uh, really focused on uh, leadership uh, of ARC over the last 25 years and their pivotal role in developing the EPC program and uh, what they saw for the future of the EPC program. In this session today, uh, we're going to be focusing on uh, past leaders of individual evidence-based practice centers throughout the country, particularly leaders who have gone on to leadership roles in clinical practice and policy uh, to get their thoughts on um, uh, their careers uh, and where they see the evidence-based practice center needing to go over the next 25 years to be as impactful um, as possible. So I'm going to start by, by introducing our, our uh, keynote speaker, Neil Poe. Uh, Dr. Poe, as many of you know, um, uh, is a professor of medicine and chief of the medicine service uh, at UCSF. Uh, and he's a former director of the Hopkins EPC program. Uh, and he's going to speak to his um, experience in the EPC program early on, how that's influenced uh, his uh, current leadership roles, uh, including at UCSF and nationally and internationally, and where he sees uh, the needs of the program for the next 25 years. So Dr. Poe, uh, thanks for joining us. slides loaded up. Um, Eddie, are we good with slides? There it is, the green button that says share screen. That's the one I want. And present. Okay, and you can advance with the clicker. Huh. When I was in it, oh. Ah. Probably on the Um. Yeah, uh, I need to go like this. And then um, I need to go back to the Zoom, share screen, take two, and there. No, no. Isn't that the right one? Okay. Mm. Now it's thinking. Sorry, folks, stand by one second. Okay, and now are we good with the slides? Okay, okay. all right, without further ado, Dr. Pell. Okay, thank you, Celia, for doing that. I could have never done that, so <laughs> I really appreciate that. Um, I, I hope it's okay if I take my mask off. I think you will be able to hear me a little bit better uh, if, I, if I do that. So um, thank you for inviting me back to the evidence synthesis world. Uh, it's a world that I'm very familiar with, although I don't uh, operate completely in that uh, space uh, uh, right now. And so it's a, a world that I truly respect. And 
I think should be lifted up uh, even more. So when I was asked to do this, I thought it might be useful if I reflect on, with you on how I came to this field, because I think it, it, it helps me shape me to think about what challenges are, as well as how far we have come and how the EPCs, I think, have uh, brought us along. And so that's what I'm going to share uh, with you uh, uh, in the next uh, uh, several minutes. And I hope to get to some of the challenges and our panelists can expound on some of those challenges and how we address those challenges uh, to uh, go even higher. So um, I, I use this picture uh, to say what I felt like uh, when I finished my fellowship and I was a new faculty member at Johns Hopkins, I felt like a sapling, uh, often uh, crowded out, not getting enough water, uh, not getting enough uh, uh, nourishment, not getting enough light uh, uh, because of all the, the giants around me who were sucking all the carbon dioxide out of the air. Um, and, uh, and, and so um, let me talk to you a little bit about that. So this was me in 1986. Uh, I arrived after being at the University of Pennsylvania doing my residency and fellowship in the Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholars Program. And I had some, uh, had learned a lot about epidemiology and biostatistics. I arrived at Johns Hopkins. Um, and this is what I often saw uh, at, at the bedside. I people would say still no improvement. I have something brand new from the laboratory that might work. And I would say, well, what is the evidence? <laughs> uh, and uh, they would just think he's just a fool. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and so um, the fool uh, entered a duel. And one of the duels that was going on at that time was the use of different contrast media, low versus high osmolality contrast media, which um, cost 10 to 20 times greater than the traditional high osmolality contrast media. And people referred to this as liquid gold and, and, uh, uh, and, and a debate was, well, what is, what are really the benefits of this in terms of like less adverse reactions during many thousands and millions of procedures that are done uh, across the United States? And, and I had written this editorial uh, about a study uh, saying, was this a healthcare luxury or was it a necessity? Um, and um, after doing that, um, and in order to address this issue, um, I was put in touch with Alan Detsky uh, in Canada because Alan had a article coming out in the Annals of Internal Medicine on uh, a meta-analysis on perioperative per parental uh, nutrition. But he also, in a companion article, had an article teaching people about how to do meta-analysis in clinical research. And it had a protocol there that you can, that you can see in the small box, and even an abstra a data abstraction form for, uh, for consideration. Um, and so um, this fool acquired this tool uh, and to, to look at this uh, issue. And I also came across this article, which was really, really changed how I looked at uh, uh, clinical research. And it was Tom Chalmers' article that I'm sure many of you are familiar with about assessing how to assess how uh, uh, the quality of a randomized trial. So what I did is I uh, uh, went to work on this issue of looking at low versus high osmolality contrast. And this was... Uh, my computer at that time. <laughs> I don't know if many of you remember this computer with the dark screen and just the green writing on the screen. And uh, you were able to access actually uh, Medline, but it was very rudimentary um, uh, uh, in, in those days and, and not much uh, could be done. And the other thing I also did, because I learned from 
Detsky's uh, and his colleagues' article that you couldn't rely exclusively on Medline to turn up all the evidence. And so you had to go to the Cardex in the, and uh, I went in Welch Library at, at Hopkins. And then I found, you'd find, uh, identify the group of articles and then I'd head to the stacks. Uh, and I would pull those journals uh, off of the stacks and um, uh, I would take them down to the basement and I would Xerox them. I had no research assistant as a new faculty member. This was just blood, sweat and tears. Uh, and I Xerox uh, the articles uh, that I found. So this was, um, I would say, uh, quite uh, cruel. Um, and um, so um, nevertheless, I persisted and uh, actually published these two articles in radiology. One was the quality, it was a quality assessment of randomized controlled trials of contrast media, where I look, I actually had, had identified a hundred randomized controlled trials, sometimes tiny, tiny trials. Um, and we looked at the quality of the evidence and we also synthesized the results from those uh, 100 trials. Um, and I it was miraculous. Um, it was just a couple of years after my faculty position. And, and I, I, someone wrote an editorial about this, about the poor quality of clinical research in radiology and that I had indicted um, them. And, but they said this, that these two articles deserve to be used as case studies for teaching experimental methods to ourselves and to our students. And there is little question that such studies in the reporting uh, could be improved. Um, so heavens, no more ridicule uh, as I had it. Um, and then uh, what happened in uh, 1989, you all know that the, the Agency for Healthcare uh, Policy and Research came into being from the Omnibus uh, Budget Reconciliation Act of 1989. It replaced the National Center for Health Services Research and Healthcare Technology Assessment. I actually had been on the study section, the healthcare technology study section uh, uh, of NCHSR and uh, the HCTA. And then AHCPR launched its Center for Medical Effectiveness Research and the Medical Treatment Effectiveness Programs. Um, and it funded patient outcomes research teams. Um, and they said, they actually mandated that they have expertise in a variety of areas. And one of those areas was literature synthesis and meta-analysis. Well, um, what happened next? Um, I was drafted. I went from being, a, as a general internist, uh, from being a radiologist to now being an ophthalmologist for the Cataract Patient Outcomes Research Team, where we did a systematic review. And I replicated what I had done in radiology to look at the rigor research methods uh, in a large number of studies of cataracts, different methods for cataract surgery and synthesize that uh, uh, data as shown in the slide. Another thing that was happening at that time is that HCPR had a, was doing guidelines and it had also the guideline for cataracts under uh, it, its realm. And, uh, I was drafted uh, to pull this evidence into that uh, that guideline. Um, uh, I have to say, this is at that time. This was one of the largest uh, cited uh, studies that I I had in the ophthalmology literature, uh, which most of my colleagues didn't see as me being a general internist. Um, but that added meta-analytic fuel uh, to my uh, career. Um, and then uh, I, I also was fortunate to join the, the port groups had a interport working groups and they had one on literature review and meta-analysis. And we got together, a group of us who were trying, who were, who were forced to do literature synthesis uh, in, in ports, regardless of what the issue was and whether it was ripe for it, uh, got together. And uh, I decided, well, maybe we should do a survey of all of us and see how the methods we're using to identify literature, to look at the quality of the literature, how we were going through 
each going through in our respective areas. And so we published uh, a report of this uh, uh, in uh, medical care. Um, and so I, I call that, are there any rules? And I'm not sure there were any rules back then. We were all doing it in different ways. And then we published a subsequent article uh, that dealt with some of the statistical issues. So that is, uh, should, should we pull? And uh, worked with uh, some really, I was amazed at high powered statisticians like Fred Mosteller and Paula Deere and Sally Morton. Uh, uh, who were part of this uh, group. Um, and then in 1999, uh, you know that there was a Healthcare Research and Quality Act, which uh, established uh, now AHRQ uh, out of AHCPR. So it was evidence-based practice centers for sure, clinical practice guidelines, no more. Um, and um, the uh, solicitation came out for the EPCs, and Al Somer, Al, who was then the dean of the School of Public Health at Hopkins, and an ophthalmologist who uh, I had worked we had worked with on the cataract report, called me into his office, and he said, "Neil, uh, he he had seen what we had done in cataract surgery, and he said, Neil." you should apply for this. And so uh, we did uh, apply for this. Uh, and I thank Al for uh, uh, forcing me to do that. <laughs> and, um, and so we, we uh, became the Johns Hopkins Evidence-Based Practice Center. Um, and I was fortunate to recruit, uh, to be able to work with two colleagues, Eric Bass and Karen Robinson. Um, um, and I have to say, working with two amazing colleagues who are super uh, cool. Um, and so we went to work. We, I mean, there were zillions of fellows and junior faculty who wanted to get into this game. So we sent them to school. And these are some of the books that you, you may have been familiar with uh, back in the day. Uh, uh, Cindy Mulrow's uh, uh, uh our uh, book on systematic reviews and Diana Petiti's uh, on meta-analysis and then Harris Cooper and, and Hedges, uh, the handbook of research synthesis. Um, and it, it was really uh, fun, but I have to say it was a little like uh, herding cats sometimes. And I think you can relate to that in your teams and trying to uh, adhere to deadlines and, uh, and, and deliverables. In fact, I would say it's more like herding mules. Um, so, um, you know, we produced a, a variety of reports, and these are just some in the same years uh, at, uh, at, in, at the Hopkins EPC. And... I just want to just single out a couple that I thought were interesting to me. And one was the systematic review on the value of the periodic health uh, evaluation. And the reason I single this out is, is because we had to define what usual care was. Uh, and as Dr. Valdez says, uh, you know, all health care is local. So what is usual care from a national perspective if you have to look in every community and look at what usual care is? But nevertheless, we, we did that. And we can talk more about that because I think that is one of the challenges. And um, there was this other one that we did on cultural competence. And it, it looked at, it was actually a, more of an educational, how, how do educational programs uh, who teach cultural competence, what are their yields? And it was interesting that there were a lot of process measures uh, like how it changed behaviors or how it changed attitudes, but we found no studies that showed that it changed health outcomes when that was what we were, uh, what we were really trying to, to look for in the literature. Um, and then um, I was fortunate to in the second generation of ports to have a, a port on kidney disease. And um, I remember we were trying to develop a quality of life instrument uh, to uh, measure uh, the differences in dose of dialysis and uh, 
the uh, location of home or, or in center hemodialysis. And uh, what we ended up doing was doing a formal literature review of quality of life instruments. Um, and, you know, I didn't know it at the time, but I think that's what now people would call a uh, scoping <laughs> review. Um, uh, and that it really helped us actually to develop uh, those things. Now, um, I just gave you a very jaded view. It was my view as in my myopic world as an early faculty member. But there were a lot of things going on even before that and after that. Um, you know, evidence-based medicine goes back centuries um, when uh, people looked at multiple studies for inoculation for smallpox in England and then glass uh, uh, did meta-analysis on psychotherapy and the relationship of class size and achievement in 1975. And I put this here, and maybe my colleague uh, Naomi will talk a, a little bit about this because I think the clinical efficacy assessment project that uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield had in as part of its medical necessity project actually created a demand to look at evidence to curtail reimbursement for unnecessary procedures. And in the 81, the ACP expanded. That was the same year that Sackett published a Sentinel article on critical appraisal of the medical literature. And it was in 1984 that the U.S. Preventive Service Task, Task Force began issuing guidelines. And as you can see in 85, the Blue Cross uh, and Blue Shield Association uh, uh, took strict evidence criteria for new technologies. And then the whole C project became fully funded by the ACP. I remember when I was at um, Penn, uh, my late colleague Sandy Schwartz was on that committee. And I marveled at, at, at the work that they were doing. And then in 87, uh, 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 Taddy Dickerson uh, published Sentinel work on publication bias in clinical trials. 89, Sackett produced graded recommendations from antithrombotic studies. And in 91, uh, Kaiser Permanente began its evidence-based guidelines program. And Richard Smith and the BMJ introduced the idea of evidence-based policies. And then the Cochrane collaboration that had been brewing over the years got formally established in, in 1992. And I put here up to date, because we can talk about that in a little in a minute, uh, was created in the early 1990s and Sackett moved to uh, in 94 to the Oxford Center uh, and uh, with Gordon Guyatt uh, presented the first generic hierarchy of evidence for biomedical research. BMJ launched clinical evidence shortly thereafter. Uh, in 96, uh, PubMed became private. You can now search from uh, the literature from home, not the way I had to go into the office, uh, often on uh, a Saturday morning uh, and work through the stacks. And then in 1997, I, as I said, HRQ uh, uh, was born, the evidence-based practice centers were, were born. And the National Guideline Clearinghouse was established. And then in 98, ARC took over the U.S. Presented Services Task Force and the EPCs became in, in, involved. Um, so um, what has happened in uh, 99, uh, NICE was created in the UK, uh, Quorum in 1999, the Clinical Trials uh, Gov uh, Registry and the requirement uh, by the International Committee on medical journal editors uh, to have a uh, listing in a registry. And then the grade criteria in 2004, uh, the VA began an evidence uh, synthesis program in 2007. Then PRISMA came out uh, for reporting uh, for systematic reviews. And then, as you know, in the, the ACA uh, birth pre in 2010, and really uh, addressed uh, systematic reviews. And I have to say that, uh, you know, the work that ARC did, I think, really set up PCORI, uh, this to be in legislation. I'm really glad that actually PCORI didn't try to duplicate the EPC program. 
Um, but what they did is the met they formed the methodology committee for which Mark Helfan and uh, Naomi Anderson and, and I have uh, been on, and we developed standards for systematic reviews and individual participant level data meta analysis. And then Prisma was extended to systematic reviews for network meta analyses, and here we are, uh, twenty five uh, years uh, later. So. Um, uh, what would I say that I think the EPC's productivity has been remarkable as I looked online, 770 reports, that's about 30 uh, per year. They've been mostly around the comparative effectiveness research and the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, which I think are, are, are sweet spots. And I have to say, I think they are the right focus. If you look at this, the 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 most reports have been around cancer and heart and vascular disease, the major killers in, in our uh, society. And you look at the other diseases that uh, are major causes of disability uh, in healthcare expenditures with quality improvement and patient safety as the center. So I have to say the ECP uh, reports are jewels. So an, enough of the ools, and uh, let let's, let's let me move forward because I think we we should. Pan, I hope the panelists will also talk about the future. Um, so um, this is a, a artifact. It's an artifact from four hundred ninety uh, uh, to four hundred and eighty uh, BC, and this is uh, a, a a rendering of drawing of Athena, the goddess of wisdom. And Athena was often uh, pictured with an owl. And, and so the owl has become uh, a, a symbol uh, of, of wisdom, not only being a smart animal. So I want to talk about the wisdom of the owl. And here you see in this pyramid is the hierarchy of clinical research uh, that uh, uh, Sackett and Gaia uh, uh, really uh, came up with. And what I think is interesting here is you have unfiltered information of, that goes from theory um, all the way up to individual studies, and then filtered information, which is critically a pr critical appraisal of all articles, uh, all the way with systematic reviews at the top of that pyramid. Um, but uh, you know, implementation is not guaranteed just because we produce a systematic review. In fact, it gets filtered, and and I'm going to talk a little bit about the filter. But when I was a resident at University of Pennsylvania, uh, this wise Al had written this book. He had taken a sabbatical at Stanford uh, and wrote this book and uh, and. I remember seeing John Eisenberg uh, present this work at Academy Health, uh, and I was just marveled by how he thought about the barriers to physician, optimal physician uh, decision making. And I think John really was talking about the filters and how do you get past these uh, filters. And uh, a young clinical scholar at Hopkins, uh, Michael Cabana, who's now chief of uh, pediatrics at uh, Einstein, wrote this article uh, that followed up somewhat on, on this work about why physicians don't follow uh, practice guidelines and a framework uh, for improvement. Um, so let me go back to this metaphor, uh, because I think sometimes we, like me, when I started out, we, we felt like we were saplings in this uh, 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 evidence synthesis uh, uh, world. And to be more direct, you know, there's all these things sapping the water and the sun, you know, not so that we can't even uh, breathe. And, and I'll just go around this in clockwise, the timeliness of which we can get data to people, bias in clinical decision-making, how we educate and train health professionals, the advocacy that goes on by uh, specialty or patient groups, uh, narrative re reviews, um, uh, these things keep popping up, narrative reviews, uh, you know, which are really fun to read. 
they, and, uh, you know, if you think of the busy clinician, they, do they want to sit down and read an evidence report versus a, a, a narrative review that reads almost fictional, like, uh, you know, fictional, like a novel. Um, and information overload and fatigue, uh, the geography and availability of services that Dr. Valdez talked about, a healthcare being local. There's minuscule data or even a data void, patients' preferences, rewards and penalties, coverage, cost and cost sharing, social media and narratives that go on today, and values and knowledge dissemination, communication and practice guidelines that uh, involve expert opinion, often by, I think, what Carolyn Clancy said in the early, eminence or impressionistic uh, leaders uh, uh, educating uh, uh, folks. So I, what I thought, I'm just going to take a couple of these and show you how I think about um, how they can sometimes smother uh, our ev evidence synthesis. And the first is, is coverage, cost, and cost sharing. And um, when I got into this business, I, I, I was interested in how not only, and I think John Eisenberg spoke to this, that, that it wasn't just the evidence about health outcomes, but actually costs that our systems and our clinicians cared about. And so I said, well, if you can't win, then let's join them. And so what I tried to do in a variety of articles looking at screening and prevention was combining evidence synthesis with economic analysis. And I have to say, these were very difficult kinds of work uh, to do. Um, and I often wondered whether after we published this, even in some great journals, whether anybody really looked at this or used this information because uh, in many places, if you looked in the Medicare program, cost effectiveness is not, is not used. And so I, I worried whether there actually is a receptor for that. Um, so another example that I recently got involved in uh, was one around health equity and uh, social media and narratives and values. Um, and it's this issue uh, that I think ARC is now doing work on uh, of, of how race is used in clinical algorithms. And I was asked to co-chair a task force by the NK, the National Kidney Foundation, the American Society of Nephrology, uh, to look at race in kidney function estimation. A uh, lot of pressure on us over, uh, you know, uh, a year. Um, I have to say we didn't have an evidence synthesis team, and uh, we were all unpaid volunteers uh, on this committee. Uh, the, the public was uh, breathing down our necks to create uh, some recommendations. Uh, but one of the first things we did with my co-chair, Cynthia Delgado, we decided to come up with statements of evidence and, uh, uh, and value and our values as part of the task force. And, you know, there have been multiple studies in the U.S. population and national health statistics uh, across age groups that show that African-American men and African-American women have higher serum creatinine concentrations than their white counterparts, even with the same measured gold standard of GFR. Yet many people on social media said that can't be. Um, and in fact, we had to wrestle with that. And so the, the wrestling with values versus the social media uh, uh, narratives that clashed uh, uh, with evidence. But nevertheless, we did create a pathway forward with uh, some new uh, evidence uh, being generated that now leads to a raceless and unifying approach for uh, estimation of glomerular filtration rate. So, um, Another example I will show you that is very relevant today to today is the, the data void that we often have uh, after doing systematic reviews. So um, I saw this recently, um, you know, the RAND Corporation had done a gun policy research review, okay? And 
you can, it's really disappointing. Um, no studies in many of these areas. Uh, you can see here in the center, the uh, inconclusive evidence on the bans on the assault, uh, sale of assault weapons and high capacity uh, uh, magazines. And, and many of these other policies that people have talked about. So if there is no or inconclusive data, does that mean it's not true and that we shouldn't go forward uh, 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 with strategies that you're hearing now debated uh, uh, in Congress? Um, and then there's the timeliness. Um, you know, we produce these evidence reports and, you know, they're often great if there's time that people can sit around a table to uh, chew on the evidence and decide what's best for their healthcare system. But what people, and I see our clinicians every day and our residents, is they want uh, timely data at the point of care. But it's got to be accurate. And I worry sometimes at what they're looking uh, in their phones at if they're using the best evidence. And so they use up to date a lot. Well, is that systematic or is that uh, critically uh, appraised? So how can we simultaneously achieve all those goals? And I think that's an, really an aspiration for evidence synthesis. So um, the last one is eminence or an impressionistic leaders. And this, I'm gonna show you an example where I think it wasn't a barrier, but there was a facilitator and how advocacy by specialty uh, groups can play a role. Um, th this is some work that I was involved in that where if you can see in the red box that uh, the way people measured in the NHANES, uh, the awareness of chronic conditions. And as you can see here over time, it was always interesting that diabetes and hypertension, more people were aware of that than were aware of uh, if they had chronic kidney disease. And one of the problems I think was how the question was asked because they used the question that said, uh, do you have weak or failing kidneys? A really strange question. <laughs> and, uh, um, and in fact, was that leading to the low, the reporting of low uh, awareness? And so uh, we had done a variety of studies and different data sets over time, but we produced this systematic review just recently, uh, looking at all the literature about how these questions were uh, uh, done. This was an ROC curve that showed that actually having a compound question rather than a single question actually helps. And so what, what happened actually just a few weeks ago, I, I was part of a kidney interagency uh, collaborative group of all the federal agencies led by the uh, NIH, and they decided actually to move this uh, to, to change how in NHANES it's reported using a compound question of kidney problem protein in the URI or kidney disease. And I have to say that transformation occurred because there was a NIH leader really at the head of this and support by an advocacy group, the National Kidney Foundation. So if you think about this, when you produce evidence, having a vehicle for people to support that, that becomes important. So let me leave you with some of the ruminations that I thought about we should be thinking about. First, not everything should and can be evidence synthesized. And, and ARC has criteria, but I think we should re-examine those criteria about what is selected. Um, Another is where there is no evidence does not mean it is untrue. Um, and where there is evidence does not mean it's true. That's the corollary because as you well know, publication bias can be an issue. Uh, evidence needs to compare and it's great that uh, a number of the reviews are comparative effectiveness, but we have to recognize that with complex or delivery system intervention, usual care is hard to define uh, uh, because it differs so much in different communities. Uh, 
Uh, the wheat should be separated from the chaff and proclaim, but the problem often is, is that the chaff may be all we have for needed uh, decisions. Uh, synthesis needs to be more nuanced. Not all patients and settings are equal. I, I practice in the safety net uh, healthcare system with the San Francisco Department of Health and the Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital. And there are things that we can't do in that setting or people in rural settings uh, don't have available technologies. And synthesis should be comprehensive in outcomes. Outcomes complement each other. There's no surprise. Uh, outcome, uh, not, not one outcome trumps another. So trade-offs to patient preferences and shared decision-making matters. And then, you know, we have seen the proliferation of qualitative data. And I recently learned this new term, metasynthesis, the synthesis of qualitative. Is there really a role for that? Uh, evidence synthesis, as I said, needs to be more timely, accessible, concise, and digestible for clinicians. And we need summaries, I think, that reach patients where uh, they are. And that's a place I think uh, th this could go. And as I said, to affect change, evidence needs to be tightly coupled with other forces that affect physician uh, decision-making, as uh, John Eisenberg uh, said years ago. So in concluding, um, evidence synthesis and evidence-based medicine has traveled a long distance. I believe that ARCs and your evidence-based practice uh, centers have been an important driver providing powerful energy and insights uh, on that journey. And I think the future is that we need to create, package, communicate, and position evidence synthesis in a way that it's timely, uh, accessible, and impactful. Some of the things that Dr. Valdez just said. So the best is yet to come. So this is my vision uh, of the future for evidence synthesis. So thank you very much. And uh, if there's time for questions or we'll go on to the panelists, that would be fine. Thank you so much for that very insightful presentation, Dr. Poe. Um, I am just going to get our um, slide deck back. All right, um, so we do have a few other panelists um, that I think I will let, uh, do you wanna introduce sure, them? Okay, sure. um, yeah, so we do have a few other panelists who have been joining us um, or who are joining us uh, virtually. Um, so um, I think I will let Dr. Umscheid um, introduce them and then they will be able to have their own opening comments. Thanks, Celia. And thank you, Dr. Poe, that was, uh, uh, not only uh, enlightening, but a lot of fun for uh, uh, many of us who uh, have have joined the evidence synthesis community uh, more recently over the last 20, 20 years. So it's been nice to see that that history and that evolution from your perspective. We have uh, three panelists uh, who are who will now be joining us, and I'm going to rely on Celia and and Eddie to. Uh, to let me know um, if if they're online. I believe Melissa McFeeders, Naomi Aronson, and uh, Doug Owens are all virtual, right? And and they're all joining us virtually. Are they all here at this point? Great, great. So I think what we'll do now is um, we'll give each of our panelists an opportunity um, uh, to share a few remarks. Um, um, or, or a slide um, or, or two. Um, and, and we'll start with uh, Dr. McFeeders. Um, uh, many of you know uh, Melissa McFeeders. She's former director of the Vanderbilt Evidence-Based Practice Center um, and uh, had um, a, a leadership role um, 
in the, uh, at the state level in Tennessee as the assistant commissioner of the Tennessee Department of uh, Health and is currently a, a senior scientist uh, at RTI. Um, so I wanna give Melissa an opportunity to speak. I also wanna introduce our other two panelists, Naomi Aronson, who is the former director of the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association, EPC, and is currently the executive director of evaluation, innovation, and policy at Blue Cross Blue, Blue Shield Association. Obviously a, a, a leader in our, in our um, uh, uh, payer, um, uh, amongst our payer colleagues nationally. And then last but not least, um, uh, Dr. Doug Owens, uh, who's a professor and the inaugural chair of health policy at, at Stanford and was the former director of the Stanford UCSF EPC. So we'll start with uh, Dr. McFeeters. Okay. Thank you so much. It's so exciting to be here. Um, and what a great presentation. So uh, if we could just go to the next slide. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what my careers looked like with this in this space. And so I'll just say that 25 years ago, I was a much younger person with an MPH running around RTI when Kathy Lohr stopped me in a hallway and said, you are a health services researcher and you need to come work on this program. And that is how I fell down the rabbit hole of EPC work and have never emerged happily. Um, and really it's been an extraordinary career. So many of the people who are on this call in this Zoom room and in the room there have helped to raise me professionally. And I thank you for that. What an incredible honor it's been. So as um, Craig said, I went on after a bunch of graduate school and other things to Vanderbilt, where we wrote a proposal to become an EPC and we're fortunate enough to get it. And we were the first of the second generation EPCs, as we called ourselves, because the three of us who started that had actually all trained at RTI UNC. And that's where we had learned our craft and had an incredible time. Um, I was just looking back for this presentation at the areas that we covered as an EPC there um, and at the 17 publications that I have on autism, for example, that cover the range of behavioral and medical and nutritional, all sorts of interventions and on rare diseases with PKU, cryptorchidism, hemangioma, um, nitrous for labor and delivery, lots of different topics. The common theme for our EPC was that generally speaking, we lived in the world that lacked RCTs. And so we lived very strongly in the MCH world and in the observational space. Um, and it was hard and interesting and fascinating. And we really got to tackle some amazing topics. So um, I absolutely love that and learned so much that has carried on with me. Um, in my next position, uh, I was over at the Tennessee Department of Health, as you heard. So I got recruited after about a decade of doing EPC work to head over to TDH and um, help them in a couple of different ways. My job was to build a program in informatics and analytics. Um, and we focused a lot of that work on the opioid epidemic, which was, of course, critical and hugely important across the country, but particularly in Tennessee, um, building our data-driven response to, to the epidemic. I was the PI on the CDC work around that. And then in my spare time that wasn't opioid related, um, was sort of the evidence person in the department there to help figure out how do we pull together data and evidence in a way that can actually drive our programs and our policies. And I think about those times where I sat in my office and I could look out my window and I could see the state capitol and the phone would ring regularly and it would be things like there's legislation being floated about such and such a topic and we need to have a response we need to help the governor have a response or um, what do we know about some sort of issue that's likely to affect licensure around clinical care because things are changing in terms of the rules and regulations and how do we make sure that we're doing work that supports our healthcare colleagues, um, but also allows us to do our work as a licensing agency. And so really was sitting very directly in that space of having to use evidence every day um, in the spirit of public health policy. So if we could go to the next slide, um, I'm just gonna talk about a few of the lessons that I've learned along the way that helped, um, helped me with that work. And one of the things I've learned very <laughs> acutely is that healthcare and public health are very inter interdependent not just around the data, but around things like licensure, around things like providing clinical care. The public health um, 
world actually provides a lot more clinical care than I knew at the time until I got there and realized how many patients we were actually responsible for. Um, and not just for preventive care, but for some pretty complex care. And so I had to think very carefully about how we apply evidence in those clinical settings um, in a way that made sense with a population that was very, very vulnerable. The question drives the evidence, drives the policy, drives the program. I think that's the most important thing I learned at the EPC program was how to make a good question. That time that we spend working on those key questions and making sure we're getting it right, that it makes sense, that it works for doing the review is extraordinarily important. And it plays through in everything we do in policy as well. The context is extraordinarily important. So when we think about applicability and generalizability and things like systematic reviews, that is sometimes the most important part of how a public health policy person is gonna use that evidence because they have to be able to show that it applies. One of the common things that we would hear in Tennessee was, well, we aren't Massachusetts. And that wasn't meant to be, we wanna be Massachusetts. That was, we are not Massachusetts and we look different. And so we need to apply evidence in a way that makes sense to our population. Our, um, my office's saying was numbers count, every number tells a story, every story is a person. And it really got to that idea that we have to be able to take what is real and science-based and evidence-based, but also figure out how it makes sense in our context. And what you say is important, but how you say it makes it stick. And when you're talking to legislators that may or may not have any science background, may or may not have a higher education, um, you need to know how to say things in a way that actually works. I'd head up the hill to the legislature and my boss would say as I go out the door, remember no p-values, <laughs> remember no statistics. And so learning that translation piece and how we actually communicate this evidence became really, really important. Um, and, you know, timeliness. We have very little time to actually make a difference sometimes in policy. We would get a phone call, legislatures being, being floated, we need an answer on the likely impact of such and such policy, and we need it in two hours. And so being able to actually access very clear documentation and clear evidence reviews that did that work for us in a way that was translatable was absolute gold. So next slide. I think this is the last Slide. So where are we going from here and how can the EPC actually, the program, help us in public health policy in a ton of ways? We are facing an epidemic of science skepticism. And if we can't figure out how to translate science and uncertainty and data in a way that speaks to people, that leaves folks in places like public health policy really, really vulnerable and unable to actually make those positive changes. Um, we need products that are targeted, that are aware of the cultural context in which we're trying to implement, that are responsive to the cultural issues and the legislative issues, and brief. Again, timeliness. A lot of implementers are very visual. So if I could show a picture, an infographic, a dashboard to a commissioner or a legislator or a policymaker, that could go miles and miles and miles. So the more the EPC can focus on that translation into those visual products, I think that would be incredibly helpful. Those living reviews are incredible because that means that new data is coming in, it's getting updated fast. And so when I go up the hill, I could say, and this is very, very relevant and very, very new. Um, qualitative data is incredibly important, helping us understand the context, the implementation issues, the subpopulations in which the data may or may not apply. That helps us translate it as well. Um, and finally, you know, back in 2004, Jeff Copeland and I wrote a paper called Plagues, Public Health and Politics. And basically what we said is the reality of moving things forward in public health is that you have to have evidence, you have to have a science. That's one, that's probably the most important, you know, leg of that stool. But if you don't understand the policy component and the politics component, you don't get very far. So thinking about that, even as we're focusing on that science, and that evidence, how it might be applied, um, I think really will help us think carefully about how we make our products even more useful. And I'll just say I'm back at RTI now. I've gone full circle. I'm back doing some evidence review work um, and couldn't be happier. So thanks very much to all of you for welcoming me back into the fold. Thank you so much, Dr. McPeters. Um, up next, we are going to hear from Dr. Aronson. Thank you. So, uh, as you know, we are probably the EPC that is most, or more formally the EPC most affiliated with the uh, payer community. I want to give you some sense of the role that the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association plays with respect to supporting our plans, uh, medical policy and coverage decisions with evidence reviews. We maintain a 
an inventory of approximately 400 what we call reference medical policies, which incorporate both the evidence review and a model policy, uh, medical policy set of criteria. This is really on the technology assessment side. Uh, we are, while of course the world is moving toward more integrated care, more value-based care, the truth is we are still driven by those CPT and diagnosis codes. So typically what we are dealing with is a discrete technology or cluster of related technologies in developing these medical reference policies. We uh, provide our information to our 34 independent plans who collectively have almost 115 million beneficiaries. That is something like one in three in the US population. So our reach is very large. In uh, about 10 years ago, we started a uh, basically a port, a, uh, a space called Evidence Street, uh, where I, uh, sponsors of technologies uh, could access our evidence summaries and as part of their membership could submit uh, new evidence. Of course, anybody can submit new evidence, but part of this agreement was that we would give feedback on that evidence. We would give back a report about where the weaknesses were, uh, what needs to be done, or may also be a favorable report that the sufficiency of evidence was persuasive, that the uh, balance of benefits and harms uh, supported uh, an improvement of the net health outcome. And uh, the learnings from this have been very uh, important. One, we learned that we were having very little impact in giving feedback to sponsors. That is, they had already developed their evidence base. At this point, they were really interested in their success in the market. They were not really interested in uh, generating new evidence. Occasionally, of course, there would be new evidence generated or something might be impressed that would meet our recommendations. But all in all, we found that uh, this idea that we would give feedback after the fact was not really successful. And for, I would say, almost 10 years now, we have been thinking in various forms of what I will call proactive technology evaluation. And if you will just bring me to the next slide, please. So in that respect, what do we mean? We mean trying to give input into sponsors, into, uh, to developers, as they are developing their uh, evidence base. Uh, sponsors are very attuned to the regulatory environment, the FDA, uh, the FDA requirements, but less so to what payers are looking for. And actually the FDA has recognized this gap and made a number of efforts to try to close that gap one of which is known as the Payer Communications Task Force. And uh, we actually gave input to the development of that program and have participated in the program. And the, uh, uh, the thrust of it is that uh, a sponsor who is interested in participating will be matched up with an HTA entity or health plan and receive feedback about their submission at the same time as they are preparing their submissions for the FDA. And that is certainly a step in the, in the right direction uh, be, because it's clearly, you have to be giving feedback at the evidence development stage. But as time went on, we became less and less comfortable or have become less and less comfortable with the structure of this program. That is, it is essentially consulting to a particular firm. That is the one that happens to reach out, to request the program, to get assigned to a 
uh, an HGA entity and to participate. That doesn't mean that there aren't a lot of other companies in the same space. And then it's not a more universal set of questions. And really being in the role of essentially consulting to an individual uh, company just did not sit right with us. Now, I know this has become common. NICE, uh, for example, runs, uh, runs such a program where they work with sponsors. And it certainly has its uses, but we felt it just really did not meet with what we intended. And we have looked for an alternative structure where we can look at a clinical context, a clinical setting, a clinical issue, and generate information on the, uh, in, in collaboration with uh, evidence experts and clinical experts and provide that information to our plans with the hope of promoting a virtuous cycle. That is having heard where the evidence is going, having incorporated it to our evidence policy reviews. The intent is that it becomes an in incentive for sponsors to produce that kind of evidence and therefore improve the evidence base not only for health plan decision makers, but for the, the clinical and policy world in general. And this uh, year, we really have our first uh, full-blown initiative in that respect. We are working with the Heart Failure Collaboratory. Uh, the Heart Failure Collaboratory is one of uh, a number of collaboratories that are affiliated with the, uh, with the FDA. The heart, this, the heart Failure Collaboratory is actually very impressive. They work both in the drug space, the device space. There are regulators involved. There is industry involved. There are academics involved. And we have agreed with them to sponsor a series of three panel presentations for our plans. The first is on um, phenotyping of heart failure. The second is on outcome measures in heart failure. And third will be on study design, including understanding some of the impact of, of COVID on the direction of clinical trials. We have uh, a group of 10 physician uh, and pharmacy leaders who will participate in that, who will both ask questions, but also give feedback to the heart failure experts. That is saying, well, you know, that's a really important point, but I can't translate that into CPT codes. I can't implement it. Can you give it to us in some way where we can actually execute it within the, uh, review, um, the review system and the claims system? So that is our hope for the future. I share this particular work of art with you. It is a group of five individuals working with Annette. They are trying to bring in a harvest. They are trying to uh, basically improve the, in this case, it would be the nutrition base, but in our case, we're, we're directed at the evidence base for their community. So that is our focus now going forward so that we are giving feedback as evidence uh, development takes place and that we are doing it in a context that speaks to a clinical area, a set of clinical issues, rather than a particular company. And with that, uh, I thank you. Oh, and Neil, I have to thank you for that wonderful presentation. It was terrific. Thank you, Dr. Aronson. Um, up next, we will be hearing from um, Dr. Doug Owens. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you very much. It's a Honor to be here. Craig, thanks for the invitation. Great to see Neil uh, with that fantastic overview. Um, I'm going to speak from the standpoint of a, of a consumer of evidence reviews. And for the, most of the last 20 years, I've been working on guideline development, first with the American College of Physicians, then with the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. 
And uh, just a couple of points about guidelines. First, they're, they're, they're of course, the systematic reviews are foundational. We couldn't do the, the guideline development without that. Secondly, the reach of guidelines is vast, particularly with the task force. They affect every person in the United States. And so the, they're high stakes decisions and the systematic reviews are crucial. So I just wanna make up, um, some comments about what I would like to see going forward over the next 10 years in terms of systematic reviews. I'm gonna say four, four things. Number one is additional contextualization to help you interpret the report's findings. Number two, economic analyses, uh, summaries of economic analyses. Number three, work with modelers to do modeling partnerships. And number four, a broader view of the evidence. So let me talk about each of those in turn. So first, contextualization. I think are you guys get back. Um, so one of the hardest things I think as a, as a guideline developer is that you get a very sometimes narrow slice of the evidence from systematic review. And what you don't know is what sort of information and evidence surrounds the specific questions that are being addressed. And so it's incredibly helpful to sort of understand what's known, what's not known, um, to help you interpret that. And I think one of the ways which we go, we can sometimes get in trouble in guideline development is because our reviews are narrowly focused and we don't understand the broader context. The second area is economic analyses. Uh, many guideline groups are trying to summarize the economic uh, analyses relevant to a particular intervention, the value, et cetera. We do that at the ACP, ACCAHA. It's hard to do. Uh, I think the methods are not as well developed. That would be something that would be an enormous contribution to make uh, advances in that area. One of the other, th the third is modeling partnerships. One of the other areas that we, um, we utilize very extensively on the, at the U.S. Preventive Service Task Force is collaborative modeling. And we have the evidence-based practice centers working hand in hand with the modeling team. That's an extremely potent and helpful um, approach, but I think it could be expanded. There are a lot of modeling groups that would, be, would benefit from that kind of collaboration with uh, uh, evidence-based practice centers. And then finally, the fourth thing I'd love to see is a broader view of the evidence. Um, other people have spoken about this, but there's clearly um, questions for which you have to think about um, other kinds of evidence and the traditional evidence and the hierarchy of evidence that we uh, typically use. Um, I was part of a National Academy report um, recently looking at developing systems to rate the strength of evidence in public health emergency preparedness. And there you have all kinds of evidence, case reports, after action reports, et cetera, um, that can constitute um, an important part of the evidence base. But, you know, it's very difficult for us to to use the current systems of evidence rating, et cetera, for those. So broadening our view of evidence and trying to understand when you can have confidence in these um, other types of evidence would be incredibly useful. So I know we're really very close to out of time. I'm gonna um, just close by saying I've been incredibly fortunate, both the task force and the ACP. We feel like we're supported by some of the very best uh, systematic review teams in the world. Um, and we're extremely grateful for that uh, to ARC and to the review teams. So thank you very much. Thanks to all of you for uh, your, your comments. Um, you know, I think some of the lessons that uh, Dr. McFeeder shared uh, around um, uh, interactions with legislators and policymakers. Um, Dr. Ahrens, in your comments around um, not just looking back at the work that was done, but proactively um, uh, planning uh, evaluations um, and using that to, to inform decision-making um, uh, has been um, uh, really helpful. And lastly, uh, those recommendations for where the EPC uh, needs to go um, are, are incredibly helpful. So, so thanks to all three of you. I know we're we're short on time, so I actually uh, wanted to open it up to any questions that that um, those online may have. So I don't know Eddie or, or Celia um, if if there are questions. Uh, so we have one question from Anjali. Uh, if you want to unmute Anjali, you could ask yourself. And what we can do is 
Okay. Because I do think we will likely close the virtual session around 11, just out of respect for others' time. So if there are, there are comments from those who are attending virtually. Yeah, now now is definitely your opportunity. And I may start with just uh, one question I have, uh, and any of the panel members can take this. And it's really around, you were all EPC directors in the past. Um, so um, what lessons um, from what you know now, if you knew then as an EPC director, Director, uh, how would you uh, maybe have done things differently as an EPC director? If there are one or two things that that you may have done differently with with your current life experience, so I don't know if um, uh, Dr. Poe, uh, Dr. McFeeters, Dr. Owens, Dr. Aronson, if any of you want to take that. Sure, I, I think I would I would have thought ahead from the get go about presentation and how the reports that I was working on were gonna be used to make sure that I was thinking more cleverly about, um, about how we were putting that work out into the world. Any other remarks? Well, I think given my experience in the guideline development community, I, I would have tried harder to set the context around the report and, and say more about what is known um, and what's not known, and um, to help people interpret the report. I, I would say the same thing, that um, often we, we were shielded from the stakeholders. And so I think hearing the voices of the stakeholders in a particular issue, I think helps then to frame uh, how, how you're going to go about it's really the questions and the nuances that come up uh, that are important to the, the people on the front lines. I'm going to say something I learned was uh, to take a study level meta-analysis with some caution. It can look quite different than what you would get at a patient level. And uh, this, this also is particularly true in the arena I'm working in where we're of course dealing with a lot of uh, sponsors, developers, et cetera, in which churning out uh, systematic reviews is kind of an industry to support their product. And actually we have many instances where there are more systematic reviews than there are even original articles. But that that's a specific characteristic of my environment, but I do think more generally the issue of uh, study level meta analysis versus what you might actually see at the patient level is important to keep in mind. Thank you. And I do want to be respectful of, of time, both of our of our speakers and panelists, uh, as well as those who who have uh, attended our vir virtual call. So for those of you who have to go, um, uh, very much appreciate your time and thank you for joining us. Uh, and um, uh, I hope you enjoyed um, uh, the sessions today. Um, uh, we may take just in person a, a couple more minutes to, to round out the panel. Um, and I did wanna give uh, uh, some folks here some opportunities to ask some questions, whether they've posted them online or just wanna ask, in person, so please, you know, if we have one or two questions, uh, let's definitely take advantage of, of uh, you know, the eminent panel that we have here today. Anjali, did you want to ask your question? Sure, I, I partially put them on, online thinking we may not get to them. So anyway, I had two questions and they're kind of big ones, but um, one is that, here, I'll actually read it. That might be easier. <laughs> okay. Oh, well. Um, okay. Is, uh, what, my first question is, is there a role for ARC or the EPC program, either directly or by supporting other organizations in proactively combating 
so much of the health mis misinformation that's out there that our patients encounter and in turn their providers encounter. And just a couple of possibilities possibilities would be to educate the public potentially in, deter in helping to determine what is and isn't evidence-based or at least high quality information or maybe some way of highlighting information that's of higher quality um, that people see. So that's, that's my first question. Um, and then my second question is just, um, we've heard today from our speakers how context is so important in terms of ap applicability of the evidence. And um, I'm just thinking like, do we need a more rigorous and systematic way to really determine generalizability from from our um, from our studies and our reviews. So we have what one question about uh, combating misinformation and and uh, working or supporting other organizations, um, and then another question about uh, more rigorous ways to assess generalizability. Do any of our panelists want to take either of those questions? <laughs> I'll make a comment about. Um, applicability. I, I just want to emphasize how important I think that is. We we have we face this issue um, very directly in the guideline development community. For example, in the task force, we're looking for evidence relevant to primary care practice in the U.S., but often use trials from other places in the world. Um, sometimes we have trials on treatments uh, for in our work at the ACP. Uh, that are done in other countries. They're, we don't really understand the context in which they're done and the degree to which they're applicable or not, I think is, is often um, challenging to, uh, to assess, but really crucial. So I would just vote, uh, thanks for the question. I think that um, uh, sort of more rigorous or systematic ways to think about applicability would be enormously helpful uh, in the guideline developing world. I think we should, we should do a systematic review on the question of whether uh, misinformation leads to poor health outcomes. I, I think that's I think that's a great point. Personally, I mean that you know at the least you can say that uh, boy, folks are engaged in the discussion. Um, um, Great. Any final questions before before we end the session? I, I was going to share a final thought on the question of misinformation. Sure, please and do. I have I have no actual expertise on this, uh, but uh, everything I know is from reading the New York Times. But it, it seems that the conventional ways that we think of education, et cetera, et cetera, are not going to bridge these cultural divides. And there seems to have been some success. There are small groups who have engaged in a one-to-one -one or small group basis trying to listen. This is particularly in the anti-vax, you know, uh, uh, a COVID skeptic uh, arena, uh, try to listen and engage and sort of meet the underlying issues. So I don't think this is going to be accomplished in the conventional education and outreach kind of way. I think it's going to be done very much on one-to-one -one and small group interactions. Yeah, so that, that gets back to uh, some of the comments that, that Dr. Valdez made earlier this morning around boots on the ground and, and really developing partnerships. Um, I, Hassan had a, had a final question from, from the Mayo EPC. Go ahead, Hassan. Uh, it's a question for Dr. Poe. So you showed the slide about some of the gun control uh, reviews and, and some of the perhaps misleading information like saying inconclusive data or no studies. How would you handle that if you were doing that synthesis? I mean, these are areas where there's an overwhelming uh, indirect evidence, but maybe there are no direct studies. Yeah, I, I think it's really disappointing when you really uh, look at the evidence, but it, it doesn't, it, you know, I would say that there needs to be more research uh, about that. And, um, you know, for, you know, for example, these are usually kind of natural experiments where people are comparing, you know, let's say one state 
to another state where they implemented a policy and where they where they didn't. And you know, there's lots of confounders that could uh, uh, lead to uh, misinterpretation of that. Um, and this is this is where then uh, I think uh, what I was saying is is values and expert judgment then has to fill in in that void until that evidence is is generated. But the evidence is 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 really important, uh, you know. Uh, in that, I think uh, Melissa, you know, talked about having the right evidence at the right window in time and communicating that evidence to change a, you know, policy. Um, and I think that's, that's critical. We'll, we'll certainly see how this plays out. And, and I think Dr. Owens, your comment around uh, being more inclusive of the evidence that, that we're examining in these reviews. I mean, traditionally RCTs have been the grist of systematic reviews historically, but obviously there's been a lot of evolution uh, over time. Um, and I, I do see Dr. McFeeder's points here as well on, on Zoom around, um, you know, combating misinformation with making good science accessible, uh, you know, particularly if, um, if it's translated, if it's visual, if it's surfaced uh, for people to digest. So with that, I, I want to thank you all, all of our panelists uh, and presenters uh, for joining us today and, and for sharing your, your thoughts on, on past perspectives and, and uh, a future state of the EPC. And I just want to ask everyone to, to give a round of uh, thanks to, to our panelists.